Thank you. So we start uh, immediately with uh, the next uh, presenter, Apostle Bangaliso Machubane. Mm -hmm. He is uh, the leader of the community church, East London, uh, South Africa. It's uh, one of the smaller Pentecostal charismatic uh, 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 churches. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't find a website of, of your church on the internet. Um, there is a, a large website of the church which we get uh, present, got presented before. But um, we know each other from a, a, a seminar, a conference in, in Pretoria, where Mangalisa was uh, presenting his doctoral project. And uh, that is about rules of succession in Pentecostal and charismatic uh, churches, which is always a um, critical uh, issue. Um, that was so interesting that I'm happy now to have you here and to listen to your uh, presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. That was powerful. <laughs> I don't know why they want to have me here after you. You said it all. Um, okay, basically, we are dealing with fruitful cooperation for development with independent uh, African churches, a, a decolonial perspective. I see that. Uh, so the areas I'm going to be covering is the historical background uh, of development in, uh, that is driven by aid, the role of NGOs in advancing development, the view of ICs on development, the effectiveness of NGOs versus that of AICs in development, the colonial perspective of African Pentecostalism, and fruitful cooperation towards sustainable development, all in 40 minutes or less. So help me God. <laughs> right, so I'm not a scholar, I'm a preacher. I happen to study uh, at university, but uh, I am basically a pastor of a church um, that I started 20 years ago. I'm a founder. Um, of a community church, uh, which has the local church where we are, has a thousand members. Um, it would be considered a mega church by the standards of Eastern Cape Bishop, where I am located. Uh, Eastern Cape is a semi-urban uh, environment, um, and uh, basically it's a growing church. We now have church plants in various places. Um, which can all together we number about 2,000. So it's a growing church. Um, and uh, when I was listening to His Grace a few days ago, I was thinking, wow, it's amazing how all these churches move in the same pattern. We have a high school, we have a preschool, we have a homeless program running, we have, and I'm thinking as he was counting the things, we also give out bursaries at that level, of course, in our capacity. Um, and I'm thinking it's almost like we're reading the same script. And yet theirs is a mega, mega church. I mean, it's a massive church, and ours is a very small church. And I'm thinking, wow, that's a phenomenon that's interesting, that is almost like we've read the same script. Um, it looks like that's the future uh, which we're going to be going towards. So basically, uh, most development agencies have been involved with historical missional churches, but um, the AIC is it's a new area of research, and I'm using AIC as an acronym uh, for African Independent Churches or African Indigenous Churches interchangeably, uh, which basically refers to uh, churches that have been initiated in Africa for Africans and by Africans. Um, and and NEL gives us a, even a better I, you know, explanation of African Pentecostalism, something he calls African Pentecostalism, which is different from Pentecostalism in Africa. African Pentecostalism basically represents an expression, a pneumatic expression uh, within the AICs, and I will use those terminologies uh, interchangeably. So, uh, basically, the whole idea of uh, development has been driven by aid, 
um, and there are various types of aid, humanitarian aid, charity-based aid, systemic aid. The first two are not so much, uh, you know, highly critiqued, though they are, but the, the last one, systemic aid, is the one that's highly critiqued because it has a tendency of, uh, you know, uh, producing the Africa we now know, which is in debt, um, heavily indebted to, to the North. Um, the whole idea of um, aid or development started a long time ago. We see that the US in the 19th century already started this program as a food uh, program. Uh, and really it was meant to help those nations that had, received, that had, had a serious uh, you know, uh, backlash because of the World War II uh, in 1940s. Um, and basically Britain did the same. And the point there uh, is that aid was about control over their colonies, particularly uh, with, with the Brits. A concept called Marshall, the Marshall Plan uh, was devised by George Marshall of the US, the US Secretary of, uh, of State in 1947. The whole idea was basically to assist those nations that had received after the World War II and Britain, France, Germany, Italy, Austria, Greece, Norway, and Netherlands, among others, were the ones that were assisted. What is important about this, about this particular Marshall Plan is that it had a time frame. It was five years. We're gonna help you establish yourselves, become, you know, re restructure, construction in five years. That happened, and in five years, uh, the aid stopped, and these nations were restored. And that's a point that I want you to look at. Of course, this gained America leverage of influence on foreign policy because they are the ones really who were helping out there. Now, because of the success of the Marshall Plan, um, you know, this was then taken to all other struggling nations. This is how the concept started. Um, in the 1960s, it was about industrialization. Then it changed the aid in the 1970s, was really focusing on poverty alleviation. In the 80s, it changed into, um, you know, a, a point where the Africans could no longer afford, they were owing so much, um, they could not pay back all those loans. In the 90s, uh, Africa was owing one trillion US dollars already on loans made for aid. And in the 2000s, there was a campaign to cancel Africa's debt, uh, and this was taken up by philanthropists including uh, even the Pope. Um, one of the problems with this latter approach is that solutions are coming from everywhere else except from Africa, the Africans themselves. And I think that's a very important thing to note. Um, okay, however uh, well intended these uh, you know, aids are, nothing of great significance uh, can the Africans show for these aids. Uh, the Rwanda president um, made a statement and I quote him, he says, the primary reason that there is little to show for the more than 300 billion US dollars of aid that has gone to Africa since 1979, it is that in the context of post uh, Second World War, geo, uh, geo, geopolitical and strategic uh, rivalries and economic interests, and much of this aid was spent on creating and sustaining client regimes of one type or another with minimal regard for de to development outcomes uh, on our continent, meaning there was always an ulterior motive in a nutshell. NGOs were used as an alternative to, uh, to bilaterals in the 1980s. In other words, uh, when they realized that governments, uh, you know, bilaterals between governments uh, in terms of development is not working because governments are corrupt, etc., NGOs was an alternative. Now let's look at those, All NGOs as an alternative. Uh, the reason why NGOs were taken as an alternative because they operated at the grassroots level among communities. Um, they transformed society from villages to cities to provinces. Uh, in other words, uh, they were able to stir up economic activity from grassroots level. Um, and there are three categories of NGOs, those that focus on human, humanitarian relief, those focusing on charity, um, and others who focus on small-scale small, small scale development and those who focus on issues of empowerment. In 1995, there were already 29,000 NGOs internationally, and the funds, there, were about, there was about 3.5 billion US dollars, which was just a budget towards Africa alone, and this was still even a fifth, uh, just a fifth of aid that was given towards Africa. 
NGOs were like a major bullet, uh, you know, for development. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and there was and there were civil organizations uh, because there were civil organizations and they defined they were they are the ones who defined their own mission and values. I think these pointers are very important because. Um, it shows the independence and the attraction that NGOs had. They define their own mission, they define their own values, they raise their own funds. This is, uh, you know, before they changed. The, this was the capacity they had. They were independent from any government interference. This, still, uh, this ideal state of NGOs attracted funds from government. Now when governments see or when donors see this ideal state of uh, NGOs, they say this is what we are looking for: an independent and uh, you know organization that is not uh, influenced by anybody that can actually raise economy from grassroots level. With this and, and with the increase of a neoliberal agenda, NGOs began to lose their independence because, unfortunately, as money came, they ended up becoming subcontractors of, uh, to foreign governments. Um, in other words, that role of independence changed because uh, money can change your behavior. <laughs> the view of AICs on development. AICs have a primal religious worldview, and I think this is what uh, Dr. Tete was referring to, that AICs have a, a primal religious worldview. Primal religious worldviews are those original worldviews uh, you know, that you know, most nations before civilization had of believing that everything is spiritual. There's a spirit behind every bush. There is no demarcation between secular and spiritual realities. Salvation in African Pentecostalism is viewed in its holistic sense of restoration, which brings prosperity physically, spiritually, emotionally, socially, and psychologically uh, to individuals. This holistic nature of salvation makes it attractive to Africans, hence the stupendous growth. Basically, I'm saying the same thing that you know Dr. Tete was saying to say, because of this holistic approach of salvation, that salvation is not just about um, you know liturgy, ancient liturgy, sometimes even archaic, you know, confessions, the Apostles' Creed, powerful. But how does that relate to my Monday to Friday? And somehow, the Pentecostals have an ability to package that and give you the holistic package. And this attracts your typical African. Uh, in African Pentecostalism, development is viewed as an integral part of one's salvation. So when I'm developing, I'm being saved from poverty. African Pentecostalism does not separate religion from development. It sees development as the will of God for Africa. Um, in which people prosper and have a good health, wealth, and abundance. On the other hand, underdevelopment is seen as the work of the devil, who intends to see people in Africa dying because of poverty, uh, disease, and, uh, and, uh, which is caused by underdevelopment. So, uh, and I quote Freeman here, and she says, and thus, along with hard work, development requires a war against demons. The, the perspective of African Pentecostalism is that uh, you know, underdevelopment is a, a war against demons. These are demons of poverty. You'll hear a statement from time to time in African Pentecostalism language. You'll hear a vocabulary that says, the demon of poverty, or the spirit of poverty, because everything is spiritual. And you can imagine, she says here, a notion that captures hearts and minds much more energetically than the NGO's rhetoric of war against poverty. Demons against poverty, demons as in poverty as demon and poverty as just a war against poverty. You know, be, poverty becomes a giant, it's a war. But if it's a demon, it can be cast out and bound. So we can deal with it and defeat it. NGOs versus AICs. Um, Freeman, uh, she gives this spread out to say, in terms of source of funding, NGOs depend on international donors. AICs raise their own money from their own members. Mm -hmm. Transformational focus, uh, you know, NGOs usually focus on transforming the community structurally. So they will have a, 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 a cooperative and they will set up, you know, cooperatives and they will have structures where, you know, people represent groups, uh, you know, different groups and they want to transform this entire community, which is a noble thing, but is not as effective as 
transforming firstly the individual. They don't focus on the individual, they focus on structures, on the whole community. But AICs transform the individual who then, because he's transformed, he's able to transform his community. So if it's a personal, it targets the individual, and that's the success. Everybody can relate to say, if I get transformed, my community will get transformed. Uh, that's why you find the prayers, the overnight prayers. Those overnight prayers, uh, if, you, if you put a statement that says, you know, power must change hands, which is what uh, uh, one uh, church, Mountain of Fire, Dr. Olukoya, uh, has conferences called Power Must Change, Exchange Hands. What that means is, uh, if I, I'm going to be transformed, the power that poverty has, I'm going to change, I'm going to now become the man over poverty. Poverty is going to lose its strength. People come in their numbers. It's incredible. Participation. There's limited participation in NGOs in the sense that if you've got a youth NGO, it focuses on youth only. If you've got a women's NGO, it's women only. If you've got a NGO for the paraplegic or the disabled, whatever you call them, uh, then. But in, the, in, in Pentecostal or in AICs, you'll find that development is, is diverse. You've got women, men, youth, everybody doing something, being developed individually, all at the same time. Whereas in NGOs, you find that one you know, NGO group is funded and it's focusing on one specific area and not other areas. Ideology influence NGOs because they've now become subcontractors, unfortunately, and this is a blanket statement, not all of them, but the tendency is that they've now become more, you know, their ideology has become Euro-Western, whereas the AICs remain indigenous in their ideology uh, of development. Now, this is a, a, a decolonial perspective. It's a perspective that has come as a response of that Euro-Western uh, domination, which suggests that Euro-Western modes of thinking are actually universal. It refers to the analytic approach or, and the socioeconomic and political practice opposed to pillars of Western civilization, coloniality, and modernity. Here's a point. Uh, it, it, this is a perspective that recognizes and advocates against Eurocentric views for one that is indigenous in education and reasoning. And, 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 and most of the time I hear, even in our questioning, sometimes I pick up uh, that some of our questions are based on a particular worldview, and most of it is a Eurocentric worldview, uh, that sees things from a certain angle uh, and uh, makes it hard for people to understand the AIC in that, in that thinking. Uh, Dambi Samoyo uh, laments the, how aid for Africa has made Africans worse off instead of better. She says, aid has helped make the poor poorer and growth slower, yet aid remains the centerpiece of today's development policy. In my view, throwing money at the problem does not solve the problem. It is important to study what AICs are already doing in terms of development in their daily endeavors, learn from them, and partner with them in advancing development. There is a lot that AICs are doing on ground with their own money, with their own resources, it's important for uh, the North to come and study how is it that you are doing what you are doing and you are still making it without any donor funds. Uh, there are certain principles there that make AICs self-sufficient, self-supportive. And of course, that does not mean um, we are not open to de for development. But I like what Hillary is saying when, she responds, when he responds to uh, Moyo, uh, she says, uh, he says, development is therefore needed, but it has, it, it, development that is generally accountable to, to local communities. So development is therefore needed, but it has to be accountable to the local community, not to some international office. So accountability in a decolonial perspective is not accounting to a head office somewhere in the north. It's accounting to the beneficiaries. These people are the ones you are accounting to because they are the beneficiaries of the program. So they carry power. So the difference here between, uh, I've just tried to put colonial and decolonial perspectives. In terms of reliance, dependency, you know, colonial perspective produces dependency and slavery. 
uh, you know, the Bantu education in South Africa that we experienced um, in the 70s was an education that was meant by the apartheid system to produce people that were, you know, just workers, slaves. And so, uh, as a result, you find that um, most West Africans, when they come to South Africa, uh, hence there is xenophobia, and this is just a side way, uh, it's caused by the fact that on grassroots, at grassroots level, South Africans have never been taught how to be self-reliant, uh, how to work with their own strength, because the apartheid system produced a dependency syndrome. We always go to work. We work for the white man. Uh, as a result, there's a saying that says, you know, I'm going to the white man. When you say you're going to work, that phrase means I'm going to a white man. It means, and when you are successful in South Africa, we call you, hey, you are a white man. Mlunguam, my white man. Because it is the damage that that dependency syndrome has, has, has created. Decolonial thinking is self reliant, independent. And um, I think those countries that have had liberation first, like the Western, uh, West Africa, you know, we see them being self-reliant. Uh, and, and unfortunately, xenophobia in South Africa is caused by not understanding that there are structural problems that have caused us to be where we are. It's not even about color or race or tribe. Value. Uh, the colonial system is Euro-Western. Of course, the decolonial system is indigenous in its value system. Uh, the values of Ubuntu, the values of respecting another person, the values of we are firstly human before we are black or white. We are all made in the image of God. So treat me with equal respect. Um, accountability, you know, in the colonial system, you're accountable to donors. Uh, but in the decolonial system, you're accountable to communities. Communities come together, forums of community. You sit there, you account to the elders of the community. What did you do? Even in terms of discipline, they would call, if there's a problematic child, uh, the elders are called, if the family cannot handle it, the elders are called, this child is brought, and they discipline the child as elders. So you are accountable to the community, not to uh, another, you know, uh, you know, uh, power, you know, force elsewhere. So in terms of project, uh, donor-based, uh, uh, the colonial system is donor-based, is task-oriented. In terms of decolonial thinking, is beneficiary-based. And I think this is where there will always be a problem with uh, models of accountability because. Uh, Africans are people oriented um, and Europeans tend to be very task oriented. So a project can run and uh, in as far as an African is concerned, as long as the people have been fed and they are happy and they are in order and everything is running smoothly and the people are happy. Uh, for the North, that's not enough. Happiness is not enough. Have you complied with A, B, C, D? What was the point of giving me money? Is the people. The people have ate, are sleeping, are happy. Um, but it doesn't work that way. They are task oriented and you know decolonial is, is more people oriented. All right, a fruitful, a fruitful uh, and a sustainable cooperation for development can only be possible with AICs if their decolonial ways of development are acknowledged and respected. Cooperation must start within the AICs at all three generational levels. And I'm using these three generational levels based on the presentation that was made by Frost on, on the first day we started when she categorized the AICs in terms of you know generation one, two, and three. First, cooperation must happen among us because within those three generations, there is not much cooperation. So before we talk about cooperation with agencies, we need to talk about cooperation among ourselves. Uh, our independence is our strength, and yet that very strength is also our weakness. Uh, the reason why we find that there are uh, now a lot of other, in South Africa we've got a concept called commercialization of religion, where you find that there are newer, uh, pseudo-charismatic, uh, Pentecostal you know, churches that are rising up, which are purely commercial, uh, fronting as churches, at the back, they are pushing drugs, they are pushing, I mean, one pastor said, we asked him, why, so why do you sell this water? He said, look, it's not about the water and me praying for the water. It's because this one bottle, it's, uh, you know, 50, it's one euro. If 
if I sell it, how much money do you think I'm going to make? So you, so it was a purely, it's purely a commercial, you know, interest, and that is because of the independency of, um, you know, uh, the AICs, and that is the, that is an area we need to focus on in terms of cooperation among ourselves first, so that there's some form of synergy. Back at home, I've started a group called the Pentecostal Charismatic Body uh, as an accountability body to try and counter this because of the pressure we receive from government on wanting to regulate the church because of these, uh, you know, uh, commercialization of the gospel. And um, I have to say it's not an easy one, but it's a possible one. Uh, Pentecostals, by their very nature, are independent, and to try and bring them together uh, sometimes could be fighting against the very nature of me being independent. That's what makes me me, my independence. However, if we want to go forward in development, we will have to have some form of cooperating. Uh, so that's a challenge. It may be difficult to agree on doctrinal issues, but we can at least uh, find a common ground on development projects. And it, this may, uh, in this way, uh, we can have a fruitful cooperation. Waste recycling, for example, is one way we can think of it. It, 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 it addresses two things. It addresses the issues of ecology, but it also addresses the issues of hunger. Because as you recycle, uh, you know, our government, the president just launched a recycling, waste recycling program where you are given, as you bring your waste, you get something out of that financially. So it, so it addresses hunger at the same time it addresses, you know, uh, issues of uh, ecology in terms of pollution, etc. International development agencies can contribute towards this cooperation among the AICs by putting it as a condition for development. In other words, if agencies outside can say, look, we are willing to partner as long as you guys can become you know, one group, that can be an external motivation um, that could cause us to come to the round table because we feel development is important. Um, development agencies must understand the following when it comes to AICs that AICs are basically self-sustainable, and therefore they can raise their own finances. Uh, what that means is um, it is important that we understand that we are not coming to people that have got a, a, a begging bowl. Uh, we are coming to people that can sustain themselves, however, in a small scale but or big scale, they are self-reliant. Most AICs affiliate to a mindset uh, of being involved in the seven domains of society, and Johnny Enlow, in his book, uh, The Seven Mountain Prophecy, um, you find that most AICs have this thinking. Uh, I heard our sister yesterday from Redeemed Christian Church saying that you are, you are in the church, you are grouped in your different domains. So in education, you are grouped together. We have this in our church also. In fact, once a month, we run a because our church is called Community Church. So basically we have a once a month a community service in the four Sundays. We have one every Sunday, once a month we have a community service. So we would focus on a service on education. So in that Sunday morning, we have people wearing their uh, academic regalia. It's a, it's a Sunday morning service, but it looks like a graduation. <laughs> because we're trying to conscientize the people that there's something called the domain of education, and then we invite the Minister of Education to come and talk to us and say, how can we partner as a church in the areas of education, in advancing education? Hence, our church has got a high school and a preschool uh, you know, uh, running. Um, so, and then another Sunday, another month, once a Sunday, we'll focus on a subject like um, you know, social development, which deals with issues of the homeless, issues of etc. Because we feel that, and then in the altar call that Sunday, there's something called the altar call. You call people to the altar to respond to the message. It will speak on people who feel they've got a calling in a specific domain that's being emphasized. Already what that does is that it attracts professionals to the church who feel that, oh, this church is relevant. Relevance is a key word. It affects my day to day. I'm not just there singing songs, lifting up hands. I'm actually empowered, once again the term, empowered for the whole week. Because this is the area of my call. They must not take away from them the ability to self-sustain uh, by, uh, uh, by donor funds, but must enhance them or by, uh, to self-sustain, uh, but must enhance it by matching the finances already raised. In other words, don't throw money at the AICs lest we become like the NGOs. Because the NGOs started very well like the AICs, but as money came, here's the danger, as money comes, your behavior starts to change. And this is our fear. 
this will ensure that they still have some level of ownership. So what we're saying is, match our finances. If I raise 100 million, uh, you know, to do something, then match my efforts. Give me another 100 million so that my efforts are extended. Uh, the concept of don't give me fish, show me how to, how to fish. The findings of empirical research uh, by the research of Ullman, did I say that right? And Grubb and Frost um, on AICs, it's a point of departure. Um, when I was reading their research in 2016, I realized that I was never part of the interview, but I realized that I can relate very well to their findings. Uh, and I can authenticate them if they needed authentication and validity. Um, because uh, in, in, in AICs, you know, spiritual development is definitely part of development. Uh, there needs to be respect for AIC values. Most of the time when we deal with the North, there's a sense of disrespect undermining uh, our values. You know, to say, why do you do what you do? As though our values are less important. Um, and it's important that uh, issues of account administrative accountability structures are put in place. However, I say AICs, because of their informal and structured way of doing things, uh, although they're effective at grassroots level, they've got these challenges of administration and accountability. Uh, I qualify that in the next one to say, in such instances, development agencies must learn, number one, how AICs operate on the ground then they can help in developing a training and an administration and accountability that uh, enculturates the ideas uh, the ideals of AICs. In other words, sometimes if you're running a project, you've got these huge forms you've got to fill up. And um, because there's a particular template and there are specs, you've got, and you find that it doesn't, re it's, it needs an ex it's a certain expertise uh, however, it would be great if, you know, the North can come down and see what do we do and then develop a template that, that includes the, the way we understand accountability. For example, if I've accounted to the elders, uh, that should be regarded as accountability. And then they could translate it and the elders could translate it and it could be, in other words, is there a form? Because sometimes the accountability line is very scientific, very high level, but it does not bring in uh, the basic African understanding of issues. Transparency from both sides. What is the actual motive or objective uh, in, in, in our cooperation? The period of, of, of the project and expectation, all these must be made clear from the beginning. Uh, in other words, the concern there is um, sometimes when you deal with development agencies, you're not sure what's the small print, the fine print, and, and it needs to be, to be taken into consideration. The AICs must set the agenda. Um, so the Marshall Plan here becomes key because remember the Marshall Plan we spoke about, it was five years and it did the job and the job was done but unfortunately in Africa there's a perpetual, uh, continual feeding of finances uh, which creates a dependency syndrome. Right. We need to continue the, con the conversation between AICs themselves, between AICs and historic mission churches, and between AICs and government. Thank you so much, Mr. Barnes. That was not also powerful, not only powerful, it was also an excellent explanation of the decolonial approach of looking to the relationship of religion and development. Wonderful. <laughs> now we have uh, also one round um, of questions and then we are. Thank you so very much for your presentation. It was really, really uh, insightful for me. And I was just wondering, because you spoke about, um, there were many things uh, that I liked you spoke about, but like something I don't understand, you still said something about like, you want the North to come to you, the South, you, the ASEs. It wasn't, it wasn't really clear to me what you, whom you meant with this. And I wonder, what do you mean? Why should the North 
develop the template? Shouldn't it be like the AICs themselves or like isn't it, does not everything you say imply that you developed this template that there shouldn't be a, a template at all anymore? Like I wonder what is the situation now with the power of the money and private ownership, etc., etc. And you said it yourself, like the independency, but isn't there the need of like breaking free from even the North giving you a template and you saying you didn't like you neglecting such templates and like you you already understand that you have to like become your own I don't know lobby of interest or something like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm very happy and I would like to say thank you for the wonderful presentation. You've covered something that was actually bothering me all the time in terms of accounting to say we account differently and uh, from the panel what we've had is the, the, there should be a way we apply in order to get this cooperation which will be a challenge for us because of a uh, lack of I will say um, most of the IICs that I, I've, I've interacted with education it's a challenge as you said you reporting to the elders it's enough verbally and when you come here it should be in written and they cannot write even themselves so um, that was thank you very much for that but my question is in terms of fundraising you said something about um, um, raising money and my question will be how do you raise money from the poor members of the community of the church. One of my favorite comedians said, uh, Jesus fed about 5,000 people with uh, two loaves and five, I mean, two, five loaves and two fish. But nowadays we find uh, poor people, about 5,000 of them, feeding one man, which is their leader or their prophet or their preacher, with all that they have, which they don't even actually have. What is your take in terms of leaders who have been fed by 5,000 people instead of feeding 5,000 people? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, listening to you, you are... You, you, you almost fit in the, not almost, you fit in the older AICs. <laughs> the word indignus comes again and again and again. Uh, because really newer Pentecostals don't want to hear the word indignus. Because many times that means demons, witchcraft. But uh, it's interesting, I've heard the word indignus again and again. We'll talk about that later. Um, uh, the, the African world view, that is another, these are simpler comments, that is another interesting area uh, you've gone on and uh, uh, Dr. Mike also has gone into that. Well, come back home all of you. Uh, the, the, because the, the, the reality is that Pentecostals, uh, I, I remember listening to someone in a crusade in Uganda and said, I thank God I was this tribe, but now I'm a Christian. You see, that's what Pentecostalism had become in a certain phase. But again, it seems as if coming back home, and even Dr. Michael's talking about the, the, the whole issue of uh, the interaction between Pentecostalism and the way people understood African traditional religion, isn't it so? So th there is that interaction that is ongoing, which the AIC is picked up earlier, and it seems you are coming home. <laughs> Not home that you are losing yourselves, but I'm saying becoming Af African uh, and getting it. Um, what I'm hearing from you is, can we redefine cooperation? Does it mean if you are not going to give me money, we shall not cooperate? Two, this is a question for to our colleagues and brothers and sisters in the North. Is cooperation simply about the development of Africa or the development of the North also? When you realize, um, you, you realize what he's been saying, 
I've been to Europe, I've been to Canada, and then after discussing the projects we want to do together, I ask, we've presented what we want to do together as our needs. You must have needs which are not money, and we want to help you, but we don't want to tell you. Bring those needs on the table. Silence. So the cooperation we are talking about has to transform. Because all of us, according to his presentation, development is not simply about money. Development is about the loneliness which is in the north. Development is many things. Can we start talking about how we can help each other? <laughs> Rather than how, in listening to him, there are forms of development most likely in the South that can redefine our relationships so that all of us talk together if development is what we need, all of us need a development, according to his presentation. So how does that shift the conversation instead of being one way of regions which need development and regions which distribute development? Um, okay, thank you very much for that um, presentation. My name is Peño Monsu. I'm a UP student. Um, I am a um, Pentecostal myself, and even with uh, the previous speaker, you saw that one thing that tends to happen with the leaders is that they can be, I dare say, egotistic in that, you know, when the events, like the faith is important, that this is going to be, this pastor is going to be speaking, and you mentioned that you are working on a group that that tries to unite um, the churches. I just wanted to say, I just or, or I wanted to hear your experience. How has that been coming in trying to unite these um, leaders who have such different um, ideologies? Um, you know, in that because that's the thing. Pentecostals they always mushrooms every now and then, and that's because they differ from each other. But just like, how has your group that trying to unite them been? And what would you, what would your vision be? Because you also hardly see Pentecostals um, being able to like form a group and be able to you know comment on social issues as a unit. It's always just like one pastor who's sort of speaking on their own, and then the views are associated with one specific church. But we hardly see them come to unite. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And the last quote is for our colleague from the Fuller Seminary. Thank you, Doctor. Okay. I, it just occurred to me that um, uh, so our nonprofit organization, as I said earlier, uh, founded along with the National Ghanaian Director, an NGO in Ghana. We have the same vision. It's she's a woman, and I'll be speaking about that Saturday morning. So we have a cooperative. But I do want to say that it, um, there's learning curves that I'm going through and that she's going through as well. But I just wanted to suggest that there is a Ubuntu going on with the donors that I that is given to me on the U.S. end, and. Um, this, this, we need to have an understanding that we're accountable to our donors. So the learning curves that we're both going through, we're, they're learning, you know, learning curves. We're going through some growth, but I'm, I'm hoping that um, on the African end, there can be an understanding that that we feel on the U.S. end a commitment to our donors. So we need to have accountability that is on target. And we can't keep giving money unless that accountability happens. Because it's not our money. It's the money of our community. You know, so I just wanted to stress that. Right. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, so let me combine the last one with the first one because I think they've got a correlation. Uh, Development is an important uh, point. We all need it. I think we need to understand when I was saying that, you know, AICs are self-reliant, um, you know, they can raise their own money. That, that is true. That's what they can do. But when I was talking about how they 
when in their participation, in other words, I would expect an agent to say, an a, an a, to say, we want to help you in development. I would say to them, oh, great. If you want to help us in development, firstly, look at what we are doing, understand the values, understand the ethos, the mindset, and then, because you must be accountable to your own body, you must then contextualize this way and that way. That's the role I want developers to play. In other words, they come, they study, they see what's going on, and they appreciate the way that the locals are doing accountability. They take that and contextualize it to the way their donors will understand it. That is their role, because they are the experts on what their donors want. But what's happening right now that there's the donors expect the locals to understand the paradigms that we don't understand. They don't relate to our thinking. You know, uh, you know, a simple example here, the sun never sets in summer. <laughs> you know, so time is controlled in Africa by the sun. So when the sun sets, we go. We disappear. Here, you can still be working. It's nine, it's light. The paradigms, I'm using a simple example. So when you know what your donors are looking for, in other words, you need to take the time to study the locals. You who is sent as an agent or a go-between. You study the people, the thinking, the culture, the understanding, how they understand service delivery, how they understand projects, you know, because you cannot, in, for example, you cannot say to people, we've come to build this for you. You need to find out what would you like us to do? They firstly say, sit down. <laughs> how are you? <laughs> and you've got targets to meet. You're thinking, my goodness, when are we going to finish this thing? So you need to understand that I thought I was going to come in and out in a month. Now you realize it's going to be six months. Because the first thing is you introduce yourself and you think you're talking to the main guy, only to find that that's not the main guy. <laughs> that, is an, that is an introductory guy to the, you know, to the main guy. After you've convinced this one and you thought the deal is that he says, now that I know what you are about, let me take you to the chief. <laughs> thinking, my goodness, are we still going to the chief? <laughs> so all that, you know, it, it's a process. And I think for me, it, it, when we, partnership is very important. And, and that is how also, uh, you know, my brother, they learn. Because the one who has been there among the people goes back and says, there is another way we can do this thing. When I was working among the people, I realized we lack this, we lack that, we, we lack the soul. Because most of the time, Europeans are about targets. Build a school, build it now. Where is the school? No, we're still going through a process of accepting the idea that a school is a very necessary, but you said you need a school, yes. But how we are going to do this, it takes time. So those processes are, 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 is the North willing to pay the price to learn our processes and to work with us in that journey. So that is the, that is the role. In other words, we need them to be able to, if they want to partner with us. You know, and we do need partnership. I, shouldn't, I don't understand and say we don't need. It's not true. Africa's problems are big. They'll be solved by Africans, but with the help of others, for sure. But in the process, there's also a mutual educational process that is taking place. I don't know whether I've, I've, I've captured at least your answer. Your answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then, um, if I can get the second one now. I was writing them somewhere. Yeah. Okay. I'm I think I think the last one actually is the comedian speech. The fishing and the look. Okay, I think I've got them now. Um, 
The second one was fundraising. How do you raise funds from poor people? Uh, and uh, you know, and those leaders. Now we must understand there are those who, of course, uh, take the thing to the extreme, where there are clearly leaders who, you know, it's all about themselves. And I think it's also important that. Um, Education plays a very vital role in some of these things. Um, when, okay, let me start with the right one, with the positive and with the negative. The positive is this. It's easy to raise money in AICs. You don't need them to raise big money. When you have a million followers and they only give you one rents, you have a million rents. All of them can afford it. It's small margins, big numbers. So raising money is not a crisis. Um, it is what you do with that money that becomes a problem. If that money goes to somebody who's egotistic, um, who has insecurity issues, uh, who was never loved when they were young, <laughs> and they are looking for some level of authentication, which is part of the problems with our titles also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. More of it is just insecurity. Yes. Uh, now we feel valued. Mm. And so, so that has a lot to do with individual and personal, you know, individual people, how they handle issues. But raising money, uh, when Africans believe in you as a leader, and in AICs, you must understand that um, leaders, are seen as, you know, um, almost icons. Mm -hmm. And therefore there is also a way, depending on your people, there is a message, when you are a leader of AIC churches, which means, you know, in an affluent environment, in an affluent neighborhood, you measure to the standard of your people. In other words, if you are driving a downtrodden Toyota Corolla in a neighborhood of people who are driving Bentleys, this is your congregant members, you are irrelevant. And the other way around is also the truth. If you are in the rural areas and you are pushing, you know, a, uh, what do you call that car? <laughs> a major, you know, uh, hunter, ha what is that, hammer? You are driving a hammer <laughs> coming among people who are driving donkeys. It becomes an issue. However, however, if you have taught them that this is success, success looks like this, pursue it. It may be a psychological help for them to say, ah, my pastor, did you see his car? I shall drive a car like that. And then he pursues that success, he works hard. He, so it, it depends on what angle you are looking at it. And the individual is a problem. Fundraising is easy in AICs, very easy. Tithes and offerings are not an issue. Uh, but we don't even need tithes and offerings. We just, we have numbers. They must just give us little money, multiply by those numbers, uh, things can happen. Coming back home, yes we are, we've always been home. <laughs> but I think the difference is you are differentiating us with classical Pentecostals. Classical Pentecostals are a little bit more rigid in the sense that Theirs is a gospel they received from the missionaries directly. And there are certain principles that were taught there which sometimes um, demonize culture and cultural practices. What Neo Pentecostals are doing, they are basically upgrading <coughs> culture. <coughs> I'm looking now to the, to the watch, <laughs> not to the sun, but to the watch. And can you, can you shout? Can you 
Shout the PCB. PCB. Thank you. Um, yes, it's very difficult to bring Pentecostals together. Um, but when we have a common enemy, it's easy. So in the South African case, our common enemy was a regulation. The government was prepared to regulate us. So we are forced to come together and develop self-regulatory programs and processes and policies. Otherwise, we're going to be in, in a mess. So um, it's a slow process because as Pentecostals, we are also very egotistic. Uh, when you have two Pentecostals in one, in one room, it's, it's, it's a small room. <laughs> but I'm happy that uh, here we have very civil Pentecostals. <laughs> then the, last, the last one on Ubuntu and accountability. I think I've covered that. Yeah. Okay.